Chris Carter of the North Shore Drive podcast for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette here. The combine is finished, but what has impacted the Steelers draft plans from that combine? I'm joined today by Ray Fittipaldo, a Steelers beat writer who was on hand in the combine with me in Indianapolis. We'll go over our thoughts right here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Ray Fittipato, Steelers beat writer. We're both of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, which you can go to check out all of our content at post-gazette.com. And if you're enjoying the North Shore Drive podcast, remember, we do daily content from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette that you can find either on our podcasting network by just by searching the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette or the North Shore Drive podcast, or you can search us up on YouTube by looking up Post-Gazette Sports to get all of our sports content. Remember, this show comes out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Like the video if you enjoyed. Subscribe to this channel to get all of our content here from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. As you can see, Ray is back. I'm on my way to Greensboro, North Carolina. That's where I'll be next covering the ACC term with Noah Hiles. We'll be having exclusive coverage for you there, uh, doing doing our duties there, uh, and giving probably some more content and recordings uh, when we get to our hotel room there. But for now, I'm here with Ray. Ray, now that you're back, we've seen some amazing 40 times the big question that I think everyone has been asking now that we've started to see a lot of the players that everyone was talking about how, do you think that there's been a close? We were a lot closer to figuring out what group the Steelers are going to hang on to more than any other with that first round pick, or are we just as lost as before? Yeah, Chris. I mean, I wouldn't say we're just as lost as before, but I still think there's a lot that has to be determined. And I think, you know, the coaches and the GM and all of his scouts are going to come back from the combine and they're going to talk and uh, they're going to fill in the pieces in free agency and then they're going to go to the pro day. So what I'm trying to say is there's still almost two months left in this process. What I will tell you was I didn't see a lot of the top targets in the draft, not only Steelers targets, but Mm -hmm. a lot of the top guys. I didn't see a lot of bad times or a lot of bad workouts. Right. I mean, did Joey Porter disappoint in anything? Um, I think think he ran what a four, four, seven. Um, I mean, for, for a guy his size, 6'2", I, I think that's plenty good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I still think it's the same three positions at number 17. I think it's cornerback. I think it's O-line and it's D-line. But I think we still have a long way to go before we're able to narrow it down and maybe get a, you know, a name or two. I think maybe that will come, um, you know, sometime in the next, uh, you know, five to six weeks before the draft. No, I agree. I agree that it's I think we're still at the same position groups, but it makes me wonder now that we've seen some of these guys run like we talked about cornerback a lot going into the combine. Then we even talked about cornerback during the combine. But now the combine's over. It just I'm always impressed every year about how many big time athletes there are. that are just so explosive, so fast and just so agile. And this was another example of that. Christian Gonzalez, who both you and I were, were, were talking about looking like the top cornerback prospect. He ran a 4.38 in the 40-yard dash. He tested very well across the board. But there were plenty of guys who tested very well. Uh, Kelly Ringo the, uh, from, from Georgia, 4.36 in the 40-yard dash. Emmanuel Forbes, 4.35. Uh, Deontay Banks and Ja'Cory Bennett, both the Maryland cornerbacks, ran a 4.35 and a 4.30, uh, the second and third best uh, times in the in the forty yard dash, um, and then I mean again you look at you look at their verticals. Uh, Deontay Bank, Banks led in that. Christian Gonzalez came in third. Julius Brents uh, came in, came in second there. Um, you you look at how explosive they are with the broad, broad jump. Julius Brents and Deontay Banks won, won that one. That's also where Cam Smith pumped up. But I, I think that there's now I, this is what I wonder with Devin Witherspoon not participating in drills. Is Deontay Banks becoming good enough? And again, we'll see with pro days and how people talk to him. But do you did you feel that his performance is enough to put him in that conversation with, you know, maybe not the one A prospects, but being a potential first round cornerback? There was questions about that, but I think he might have solidified his position there as at least a pick in the twenties somewhere. Yeah, I think people knew that he was going to test well. I think you're right. You know, I think you saw him more um, in the second round leading up to the combine. Um, so it will be interesting to see 
um, you know, how he plays out. Uh, you, you mentioned Ringo. How, how about Ringo? Did, did he um, yes. do enough to maybe solidify himself in the first round? You see him all over the place now. You know, J Daniel Jeremiah's latest top 50, I want to say he was down late 30s, early 40s now. So I think Banks was right in that same category. Now, I know Daniel did that before the combine. Um, so, yeah, I, I think all this stuff, um, all these teams are going to go home and talk about it. Now, for the most part, Chris, um, if you were, uh, let's say you were a mid to late second rounder going into this thing, and you you nailed everything. You nailed the interviews. You right. nailed, uh, you, you know, the testing, the running, all that stuff. Yeah, there's a chance that you can move up to maybe early round, maybe you know, very end of the first round. But for the most part, uh, the GMs and the coaches, they, they like the tape. Um, as, as the main barometer, that, that's always what they go back to. And the testing is in the interviews, it's just, you know, it's another benchmark in the evaluation process. So I don't think anyone's going to get too, too excited, you know, over anything that happened to the combine, but more of it's uh, a reaffirmation of what they saw on tape and what they saw in person during the season. It's a good question to see. Um, you know, so what what people might have changed their opinions on certain guys, you know, and you talked about some of those guys in the second and third rounds that might have boosted the, boosted their way up. Julius Brent's out of Kansas State is a guy. I loved his senior boy. I loved his measurables. Uh, and then he came in. He didn't, you know, he wasn't a guy that wasn't going to wow with the 40-yard dash, and he didn't wow with the 40-yard dash. Uh, I think he actually he, he ran in the 4-5 range um, when, it, when it came to that. Um, a little actually right, right around the four, four, but still, but what I thought where he looked really good, he had, he was up there uh, with the second best vertical. He had the best broad jump. He had the best, the best three cone, and he had the best 20 yard shuttle. Those are all more about explosiveness, agility, and the things that I think that he does well. And that you really need to do well as a cornerback. It's great to have 40 times speed. It's great to be able to run in a straight line and be able to have recovery speed to catch up to the fastest receivers in the NFL. You do need that but it's better to have the guys who, who are able to mirror receivers react quickly get in position and he's one of those guys I don't, I'm not saying Julius Burns is a first round pick but he might have worked his way up into maybe that second round pick and something that the Steelers should consider because I, I I continue to compare him to Ike Taylor with the with the way that he's able to physically react to things uh, I just think that he's a, he's a longer cornerback I think they measured him at six two and three quarters instead of the six four number that we were given going into the combine uh, before that he got measured there but he's one of those guys I think that definitely improved his stock and like you said as, as these pro days happen we'll start to see more of these players kind of slotting into different positions as we get more solidified rankings from people who are studying this and he had a good senior bowl too and i think the, yeah. the prospects that stacked good senior bowls uh on top of good combines and they they say okay go to the pro day okay he does it at the pro day too that's what all these people want to see you know they want to see the consistency uh throughout the process uh another guy who did very 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 well at the senior bowl and uh, also did very, very well in the testing at the Combine is the defensive end, defensive tackle from Northwestern. I call him A-squared because I can't pronounce his first <laughs> and last name. I think it's Edible Way, I think is his name, yeah. Ed Edible Way, okay. So he ran, Chris, I mean, we talked about on Friday, we talked about Kansas 4 mm -hmm. six, seven. Okay, this is a guy at Northwestern who played inside as a three technique mm -hmm. until this last fall – when he bumped outside. So if he would have tested uh, with the interior defensive tackles, he would have obliterated what Kansas yeah. did. Yeah, he would have. Right. Four I mean, he, four nine. That guy is a phenomenal um, explosive yeah. athlete. Now, you know, you got to go back and look at the tape and, you know, what he did in college. Yeah. But in terms of what I saw at the senior bowl in person against those senior bowl offensive linemen, um, I would think he's a guy who's also – going to rise up draft boards and rise up pretty quickly here. Absolutely. I want to get to more positions across the board. Uh, I want to talk about linebacker with Ray because uh, you wrote a piece on the pass rushers. We'll talk about the pass rushers, but how also linebackers, I think that there were some guys that really helped themselves solidify because people have been questioning the depth of this linebacker class. We'll get into who those guys were in just a minute here on the North Shore Drive podcast. So don't go anywhere. But first, I want to talk to you guys about our great sponsor at Valley Pool and Spa. Would it be nice if, not, if while you're gearing, gearing up for the weather to get warmer, you're waiting for it to kick. We're here in March. 
but you know it's still a little chilly outside, the best way to relax is having a, a spa, a sauna, or a hot tub installed right in your home where you can just refresh in your own space and not have to worry about anything. And the best place to do that is Valley Pool and Spa. And you can go to their website, valleypoolspa.com. You'll see all the savings that you can get with their hot tubs, swim spas, and saunas on sale right now. And they also have the, the special Finlayo sauna that will help you feel like a, a new person going out and ready to tackle your day after you rest in it. So go to valleypoolspa.com right now, find the hot tub, the swim spa, the sauna of your dreams, and find out how they can help you install it right near your home so you can feel relaxed tackling your day again. Check out Valley Pool Spa, and that's at valleypoolspa.com. Back here in the North Shore Drive podcast, Chris Carter with Ray Fittipato, or both of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Ray, let's talk about the pass rushes before we get to the linebackers. You wrote a piece about that for Sunday that, that, that came out. And listen, pass rushers does, isn't just limited to edge guys. This is also interior pass rushers, and that's something the Steelers need to find for the long term. You and I have talked about the need to find, like, the next Cam Hayward. You know, DeMarvin Leal seems solid uh you know and, and like he's coming along but i think they need a mauler they need a big guy who's going to be able to eat up blocks help stuff the run but also be an, a, a solid pass rusher you had them taking lucas van ness in your first mock draft that you wrote for the for the steelers how did you feel van ness compared out to a lot of these up these guys that lined up up front and was there a clear winner that kind of topped your eyes and says hey like this guy you know, the guy who won't be taken in the top 10 and may fall to 17 and fit the Steelers really well. Yeah, I mean, I think Van Ness is still in that range, quite honestly. I think he didn't do anything at the Combine that, that disappointed me, and I don't think he disappointed any teams. He ran really well. I think he did very well in the agility uh, testing as well. Um, now, when you're talking about D-line in that, uh, you know, 17 area, uh, you know, Miles Murphy, I mean, he's 6'5", 275. I think he's probably more of a 4'3 end. I mean, I, you could ask yeah. him, you know, to put on some weight, but, you know, he's another guy that you, you kind of see in that range, like 10 to, 10 to 25, I think, is where he'll probably end up going off the board. But there's a lot of other interesting guys, Chris. I mean, Brian Brzee out of Clemson. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of all these guys that um, – are in this conversation. I think he is more of the prototypical Steelers five technique, right? I think he's six, yeah. five, he's three bills already. I think he came in at two ninety eight or something like that. And uh, he, he, he's really active and he's a really good athlete. Now he had some injuries at Clemson that kind of, you know, curtailed what he can do. I thought, right. Um, but, you know, here's the interesting thing. If you go back to 2014, uh, Stefan Tuitt had an injury. I want to say Stefan Tuitt had like a core muscle type injury. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember, I think John Mitchell said he went down to Notre Dame and uh, he, he worked Tuitt out on his own. And he walked away thinking, okay, this injury isn't an issue. And the Sears got Stefan Tuitt at number 46 overall. Now, could that same thing happen with Brzee? Uh, Brzee? Uh, you know, could they get him at 32? Or could they possibly get him at 49, um, you know, considering the lack of experience? He's coming out after his redshirt sophomore year, and uh, he doesn't have a lot of, you know, production or experience on his resume. So when I think of Brzee, you know, I'm thinking more second round for him, but I think mm -hmm. he would be a very, very good pickup for the Steelers. Back to Lucas Van Ness, you were absolutely right. He did very well in the agility drill, 20-yard shuttle. He had he had a time of 4.32 seconds. That was sec second amongst all edge rushers. And in the cone, cone three cone drill, he also finished second with a 7.02 second time. Uh, very good display from him. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, for a season on the show like that. But – uh, looking at that, I, I, it makes me wonder what's going to be the traits that the Steelers value the most about edge rushers and, and just passers again, because it's not just can you line up on the edge, can you line up on yeah. the interior? You know, Kalijah Kansi posted a 40 time, but that's all he did because he has a hurt shoulder and he wants to be able to be fully ready for Pitt's Pro Day on March 29th, and that'll be the day that he shows all the other things. But, you know, him setting the record for a, a, an official defensive tackle to run was very impressive. But, of course, that's not always the th – you're not, you're not ever going to ask a defensive tackle to run for 40 yards. It's more so how explosive can you be with your feet? How – 
quick can you be? How strong can you be at the point of attack? And how can you adjust your your body weight to get the right angles and, and win with pass rushing techniques or also taking on double teams? Those are all the things that I think they're looking at. And I think Brzee, I think he, he was a, he's a guy that certainly has helped his stock. I think Lucas Van Ness certainly helped his stock. Uh, but I think this could be a tricky position here because you, the two guys we're talking about, the Brzee and, and Ness, they're not guys who were like, you know, talked about for years for their ability and how they were, how everyone couldn't wait for them to come out like the way Jalen Carter is, or even the way Kalaja Kansi is. Kalaja Kansi has been a starting defensive tackle for Pitt for the past three seasons. Van Ness was more of a rotational guy for Iowa. And, you know, Brazil, you know, had, you know, it was a guy who was figuring out his place and also dealing with injuries. I, I think it could be very interesting. We talk a lot about the Steelers wanting to get frontline guys in the defense, wanting to help with pass rushing guys in the box. Is it possible that because of guys like this, that they're going to be comfortable, again, waiting for the second round to maybe go after those guys um, and being able to focus on other priorities like cornerback or maybe even offensive line? And those guys just competed Sunday. Um, is it possible that we see that become kind of the focus is to wait for that second second round crop of guys for the defensive front? Yeah, you could see that. And I think uh, a telltale sign will be what they do in free agency on that, right? Um, yeah. You know, they got a big – uh, free agent of their own and Larry Ogunjobi. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see if they can get that done. Um, let's say they don't get Larry done. Uh, do they still sign someone of the same caliber? Yeah. Um, and, if, and if they do, then, okay, that would say, okay, they're still set with Hayward and they're still, they, they got another starting caliber player. Then that's where I think you could see a 32 or 49. You don't necessarily need that plug and play starter, but you can sort of get a guy uh, that you can groom behind um, two starters and have him ready for 2024 or whenever he's needed. So, yeah, I you know, given the, uh, the depth of that class and um, some of the other needs that you might um, have at number 17, and I wrote about this as well, Chris, uh, some of these guys, it, they're, they're tweeners. And yeah. it's, it's hard when you're a team like the Steelers when uh, – you know, I read about this with, with Brian Branch, uh, who's a who's a slot corner and in, in a safety. Um, you could make it work, yes, but um, you could also try to make it work with a guy like Van Ness. Uh, but he's not mm -hmm. your prototypical five technique. Right. And what he did, you just listed his numbers at the combine. I mean, he solidified himself as one of the the best athletes among the edge rushers, much more so than any anyone on the interior. So. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think the more I think about it, I, I think maybe 32 or 49 for a defensive lineman makes more sense. But again, they will go strictly by their board. If they got a highly rated player there who happens to play defensive line, they will make it work. They were not afraid to take the, the Marvin Leal last year in the third round when he was a bit of a tweener. And I don't think they would be afraid to take a similar type of player um, again this year, even if it is at number 17. I want to talk to you about linebacker, maybe some of these other positions. We also do have to talk about offensive line because a lot of people have been looking at that as uh, as one of the primary positions for the Steelers to attack in this draft. And you know, we keep talking about defensive players. I get it. I think that there's I mean, if you're sitting there wondering, what about these offensive linemen? I'm right with you. We'll talk about them and the linebackers in just a minute here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Don't go anywhere. But first... Got to talk to you guys about our great sponsors at Yinzers in the Berg. Yinzers, listen up. The Steelers season is over, but the Penguins are trying to surge back into the playoff conversation. Pitt basketball is trying to make a run. There's so many things to be excited about in Pittsburgh sports, and the best place to get all your Pittsburgh sports apparel and accessories is Yinzers in the Berg. They have two stores in the Strip District that you can go to any time to get Steelers, Pirates, Penguins, Pitt, all sorts of Pittsburgh sports gear right available right in the store. Or if you can't make it to the Strip District, that's fine. Go to their website, YinzersPGH.com. That's YinzersPGH.com, and you can check out all the gear that they can let you could want for yourself, for your friends, for your family, for your loved ones, or for great gifts. So go to Yinzers of the Berg right now. Again, at two stores in the Strip District or visiting their website, yinzerspgh.com. That's yinzerspgh.com for all your Pittsburgh sports apparel. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast, Chris Carter, Ray Fittipato. Ray, before we get to the offensive line, I got to ask you about this linebacker class because – I felt personally there were some guys that really solidified themselves, one being Jack Campbell, the linebacker out of Iowa. Now, 
Uh, there were different guys that impressed in different ways. Trenton Simpson got to show off his speed. He ran a 4.43, and that was very impressive to see. It shows that he can move, and he's definitely the missile type of player uh, that, that we've seen there. But Jack Campbell had the third best vertical jump at 37 and a half. Um, he had the second best broad jump at uh, 10 feet and, and 8 inches. He had the best three cone drill, um, and he had the best 20 yard shuttle. He showed to be one of the best uh, pure athletes in this in this draft class. And he's a guy that you know we've talked about the Steelers needing to find a linebacker of the future, and they don't have to per se with this class, but it would certainly be a bonus if they could if they could get one. What do you think of Jack Campbell versus Drew Sanders, Trenton Simpson, and the other linebackers of this class? Yeah, now correct me if I'm wrong. I think I saw when I was out in Indy, Chris, that his relative athletic score was very, very similar uh, to T.J. Watts. And yes, we all it was. Know, yes. Yeah. So, and we all know what kind of athlete uh, T.J. Watt was, and he ended up going, what, number 30 overall. So, mm -hmm. uh, now Campbell, I was thinking Campbell more – you know, late second, third round, one into right the field, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now, did hey, listen, for, for a team like the Steelers who pick at number 49, did he work his way up into that conversation? Mm -hmm. um, and what, you know, what Omar Khan and Mike Tomlin and all those guys are going to have to do, they're going to have to go back to the tape and watch, watch Campbell um, at Iowa and see if that athleticism um, comes out in the games, right? So uh, I think they'll all be going back. I did not expect Jack Campbell uh, to be as highly rated in the RAS score as he was. I'm going to be honest, Chris. Um, and he is another guy. You, you make a really good point. He is a guy who can maybe work his way into that mid-second round conversation now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's another guy who will be rising up those draft boards after the combine. Yeah, I'm very interested to see what the Steelers do there and also what the NFL does there because linebacker has been a tricky position to draft. You know, people have gotten their linebackers, but, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of guys who just who are pure run stuffers and pass rushers. And there's a lot of guys who are pure cover linebackers. And there's very, that very rare combination of both. And some people allege that he could do both there. And we saw certainly saw with the agility that might be something that he could hold on to. So keep an eye on the linebackers. But let's talk about the offensive line because I know a lot of people are impatiently waiting to see, okay, but what about the offensive line? And I and I hear you now. The offensive lineman tested Sunday for full, full disclosure. We're recording on Sunday, so not everything has been finished. Uh, but I, I think one guy that, that did confirm that he was the kind of athlete that people expected was Peter Skaronsky out of Northwestern. You know, he's the offensive tackle prospect who's 6'4", not 6'5", and his arms are like, you know, an inch and a half shorter than what NFL teams typically look for in offensive tackles. So people are wondering, is he more of a guard than a tackle? But looking at how he did, he had the second best broad jump at nine nine feet and seven, and seven inches. He had the second best... Uh, vertical jump at 34.5 inches. Um, you know, he showed that I think I think he showed the ability to be able uh, to, 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 you know, be to be a strong, strong, tough guy. And at the podium, you know, he was talking about like, you know, hey, like, I believe that, you know, you're, you're winning mostly with your feet and trying to keep your feet moving and readjusting your position. Is he so you think he's going to be the top tackle off the board or is he because of his size, a guy that could drop down and maybe be a guy the Steelers keep their eye on for the first round? Nah, I mean, I still think he'll be the top offensive lineman off the board. It'll be up to whichever team that selects him to decide if he's going to be a guard or a tackle. Um, but to me, I just think he's more polished, Chris, um, than either Paris Johnson or Broderick Jones. Um, and I understand, you know, guys like Broderick Jones and, and Paris Johnson, there might be people who think that those two have higher ceilings than a guy like Peter Skaronsky, who may – um, end up a guard, depending on which team uh, drafts him. But to me, um, I would give the guy a chance to play tackle. Um, he's great with his feet. He's a technician. He's He knows what he's doing. His grandfather played in the NFL. He's kind of built for this. Um, you know, he, he's a guy who, um, you know, he, he's – we were just talking about higher ceilings perhaps for, for other guys. I mean, Skaronsky's got maybe the highest floor of any – prospect in this draft. I mean, the guy's considered a plug and play starter no matter what. And I think he he's even got potential to be, you know, a, a pro bowl or, um, or an all pro if he continues to progress. So I still think he's going to be first off the board. And I, I seriously doubt that he's going to be there 
at number 17 when the Steelers pick. I, I agree with your assessment. I just wonder, we've talked a lot about how, you know, offensive tackles go fast in this class. Um, sure. We look at, at an offensive, and go fast in any class, really. But there's four guys that I think we have talked about consistently uh, with the top guys. Of course, Peter Skaronsky, of course, Paris Johnson. We've talked about Broderick Jones, and I believe I'm missing someone. I, I always do this. I name the three of them, and then I forget the fourth. Um, those, are th- those are three of the top guys, Paris Johnson, Peter Skaronsky, Broderick Jones. I mean, you could go John Michael Schmitz is probably the top center. Yeah, definitely um, him. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of guys. You know, the Bergeron from Syracuse. Um, Bergeron's I mean, a good guy. I like him in the second round. Yeah, I mean, you got a bunch of the interior guys. Steve Avia from, from TCU. I mean, you know, I, I think the sweet spot for interior offensive linemen in this draft, Chris, is going to be second round. Yeah. Um, I think a, a lot of the centers and a lot of the guards – are going to go off the board then. So, you know, Skaronsky, you know, he's going to be one of the top three, and he may end up playing guard. But I think 32 through 64, um, I, I think you're going to see a bunch of guards and centers go off because that's um, that's a very deep and a very good position in this year's draft. I, I hear that entirely. And that could be uh, – that's where I'm intrigued to see how fast things go. Second round does seem like the sweet spot. You know, Cyrus Torrance is a guy that a lot of people talked about. Schmitz is a guy that a lot of people talked about. Anton Harrison is a guy, you know, Oklahoma and Darnell Wright and Matthew Bergeron. That's the, like that second class of offensive tackles who uh, who I think that could get looks at. And if they're sitting there in the second round, are they the Steelers' pick? It just – it's going to be it, – it's always fun to kind of weigh the differences between each position group and where guys where guys should be picked because, you know, we're going to talk a lot about the top you – know, that 17th pick that the Steelers have and should they trade down, should they, you know, stay there, should they try to, you know, make sure it's an offensive lineman or they just take best player available and then adjust accordingly. A lot of that changes so much on, on you know, on draft day with who flies off the board. I just – I have a hard time seeing the t- any of the top three tackles or even the top three corners still being there. We talked about that on Friday with, you know, how a lot of those guys were impressing at the podium. I, I wonder, you know, what's the position that creeps up that the Steelers are like, hey, we're getting really good value because there were four quarterbacks off the board because Anthony Richardson tested off the charts. That was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you know, there's four quarterbacks, three offensive tackles, four cornerbacks. That's already 11 picks right there. That's not a wide receiver. That's not an interior offensive lineman. That's not, you know, uh, you know, defensive edge. lineman, edge, edge yeah. rushers. So eventually there's going to be a position group that I think that gets overlooked in this in this process and could be the guy that falls that slips to them you know we, you talked about tj watts slipping all the way down to 30 and now he's the superstar cam hayward another guy that they were like they never thought he would slip down to them at 31 is there a position group that you're looking at right now that this could be the sweet spot that everyone's kind of talking about these top guys but there's certain yeah. players that you think are special yeah it's 17 um well that's a good question it's not going to be offensive tackle because there's not great depth there yeah they're going to um, take it you know, I, it's not necessarily a position of need for the Steelers, mm-hmm. uh, but edge rusher could be. You could yeah. have great value in edge rusher at number seventeen, mm-hmm. um, uh, given the depth of that class. And you mentioned quarterbacks are going to come off first. Offensive tackles always get pushed up. So, uh, yeah, you might be right, and I I don't think this is going to happen, Chris. But I've seen other people speculate about it. How about receiver? Yeah. That could that could be the sweet spot because everyone's talking about how this isn't the ultimate receiver class. You know, Quentin Johnson tested well. You know, people are looking at Jordan Addison not running the greatest forty ever, but he's also that's not that was never his game was pure speed. He's more explosive than anything else. Jackson Smith and Jigba, I thought he he had a phenomenal co- combine. You know, could that could that be the position at seventeen when we're talking about you know all you know getting strong in the trenches? You know, I personally, I still feel like the, the move would still be to address those areas, but it yeah. could end up just being like you're saying, best player available. Like, we're not just going to take the fifth edge rusher off the board or the, right. or the fifth offensive tackle off the board. Let's take the best pure player. And if it's a receiver, yeah. they, they might need to live with that. And who knows? Maybe that's the receiver that, can, that connects with Kenny Pickett and, you know, helps make this a much better offense next year with more weapons. And hey, let's let's I don't again, Chris. I, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but let's say, uh, let's say it's a receiver. Let's say it's Dalton Kincaid, the tight mm. end who, who slips to number 17, and get yourself a whole new uh, Gronkowski, Aaron Hernandez type situation going on there. Double tight end. 
And the great thing about this class is you could still get a starting offensive lineman yep. at 32. You could probably still get um, uh, a defensive lineman who can help out at number 49. Um, and maybe you can get a corner at number uh, 81 or 49. And, you know, you switch those two spots. So, um, yeah, there, there could be some wild card scenarios in there, um, depending on how the board falls. I would be surprised if they took a skill position player, an offensive skill position player yeah. at 17. But, um, hey, you, you, you got to stay true to your board, Chris. Um, you you got to pick players you think will help your football team. And, um, you know, I, I won't close the door on anything at this point um, because we are so early in this draft, uh, draft process right now. Absolutely. We'll have more mock drafts and, and discussions about this draft process as we roll along here. Uh, the offensive linemen are finishing their drills as we're recording this. We'll talk more about that with all, with all of our Post-Gazette beat writers. We'll also get some Penguins talk a little bit going on. And, of course, ACC tournament talk as the week goes on because that's going to be Ken Pitt basketball rebound after losing their last two games to finish the regular season. Could be tough. But if they do, it could mean the first NCAA tournament berth since the Jamie Dixon days. We'll have all that right here in the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm Chris Carter. He's Ray Fittipato. Thanks again for checking us, checking us out. Subscribe to this YouTube page to get all of the, the Post Gazette's daily content that comes out here, and as well as the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast. We'll be back on your screens and in your ears on Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. If you're watching this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For six months of digital access to post-gazette.com for just $6, click the link down below in the description.